xp, uh, why it happens, uh, why does anything happen, it's, it's a part of uh, our lives as uh, humans. Well, xp is a, um, it's a sort of disease that kids have and so they can't go on the sun, but if they do, they'll get little red dots everywhere and um, they boil up like burns. Y saber, porque a veces me dice, mamá, yo me voy a morir. Mamá, un amiguito mío me dijo que, que yo me voy a morir. O sea, él sabe de que él tiene una afección X y que no es eh, nada, nada que uno piense que, que pueda tener un futuro mejor. O sea, que si saliera la luz solar, yo creo que no duraría dos días, un minuto. Xeroderma pigmentosum is a genetically acquired disease. You inherit, you inherit the genes from your parents, which is associated with extreme sensitivity to sunlight. The disease is caused by a molecular defect in cells' ability to repair DNA that's been damaged by ultraviolet light. Normally our skin is damaged uh, on a daily basis by the ultraviolet light from the sun, but that we have a system in place to detect it and fix it. And if some slip through, we can get a skin cancer. But in a child with XP, that system is defective, and so they can get many, many skin cancers. And if those skin cancers aren't detected in time, they can even um, be very dangerous, even life-threatening. If you get a diagnosis of XP early and you can stay out of the sun, then that's going to minimize your chance of getting cancers. If, however, you get burned very severely before the XP uh, diagnosis is made, then, then that's going to predispose you to all the cancers, um, some of which can be removed and could be seen as fairly harmless, but then there's um, is the cancer of malignant melanoma, which um, is often the cause of death. My dad said that when other people found out about XP was a real thing, they didn't believe it. People will say, well, aren't they going to grow out of this? Can't you give them something for this? Um, you mean she can't play out ever in the daytime? I mean, I, I just wonder if we are not making clear what XP is. They don't understand that exposure to sun now is going to have consequences many years down the track. They don't realise that some exposure now is going to add to her developing cancers in the future. There is no level of light outside in the sun that is okay for children with XP. There is light levels inside the house that have to be a concern. Light levels every place that you go. If their son will say, I cannot play because due to sun, you know what I mean. I want to play, but I cannot play due to sun. This genetic inability to repair damaged cells was first identified in the late 1960s. Most XP patients suffer substantial cell damage before their condition is diagnosed. So they often develop serious cases of skin cancer before the age of 10. This contributes to severely shortened life expectancy. One of the first challenges XP patients face is simply getting the diagnosis. It was a summer's day and we had gone out to a party. Um, it was the middle of the day. But she was our fourth child. We had kept her in the shade all day and uh, we would not have expected that the other three would have got a sunburn from that situation, but she did and it was very severe. I took her to the doctor because I couldn't... We had suspected that it was a sunburn, but we couldn't believe it. We just... We couldn't understand how she could have got burnt. Um, and that was very hard because the doctor um, thought that maybe I had been a bit careless. I listed off all the things that I had noticed and because there were so many, he referred us to a dermatologist. Um, the weekend before we were due for the appointment, Mary had another sunburn. So she went to the dermatologist with a peeling sunburn. Um, 
that was not such a good experience, but we got a diagnosis out of it. Um, when I went to the dermatologist, she um, she just looked at Mary and said, oh, scratched her head and said, oh, oh I think she might be one of these kids who um, presents with cancer at an early age. My jaw just <laughs> dropped on the floor and and I thought, oh, what's, what's this? I had no idea. She didn't give us a name. She took some tests and, uh, and that was that. I didn't hear back from her. She didn't make arrangements for another appointment. Sometimes, sometimes the diagnosis is because a, um, a physician was uh, uh, wise enough to uh, recognize what was going on and make the diagnosis. Other times, uh, many cases, it's because uh, the parents uh, demand the diagnosis. They're, they won't rest till they find out exactly what's wrong with their child. Doctors, sometimes I have found doctors who are so rude, so cruel, you know? who doesn't understand anything about what's be, and they have verbally abuses me. And I have to be all by myself, defending myself. That will be so much different if I have a sister there, or my father, you know, to face these people and say, hey, you respect my daughter, or you respect my sister. I have to see my brother daily, because he's always been there for me. And he just plays with me um, a lot, so I look up to my brother. I have no clue why she admires me the most. Um, me and Katie, we spend a lot of time together at night outside. We, we do a lot of things. We play basketball, soccer, a couple of board games outside. We, we, do, we have some fun, so <laughs> I don't really know if just hanging out, really. I don't know why she said that, but I guess maybe it's because she doesn't get a lot of interaction with a lot of other people. I did have one surgery that it lasts about seven hours. And I couldn't even come down from bed or, you know, I had to have, to have the help from the nurses to help me to come up and down from the bed. And I did call one sister in, in New Jersey to tell her about the surgery. And you know what she said to me? Oh, Fatima, you really like trouble for yourself. It's that you really cause problems for yourself. I couldn't believe that my sister said that to me. I answered her, well, what you're trying to tell me is that I love surgeries. And I just come, I just come to the doctor to tell them, look, my back here, you can open it, no problem. I can live without doing it here. Do it to Teresa. No, she fights back. Do it to Brendan. No, Brendan and that's when they bounce me. off the mat, right? Well, no, they go. I, he goes like this. Okay. Then he. They kick, kick him up. Like, I could do it if I did it fast. I'll do it over here. No, okay. no, no. Katie, no, I'll do it no. slow. No, 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 no. Trust me, I you're not going to get hurt. Stand up. Okay, let's see. Don't hurt like, me. Ow, ow. Throughout her life, I hope that she grows to accept her disease and disorder. I, I hope she doesn't feel left out. And uh, I hope that we all stay here as long as we can and spend as much time with her as possible. Because she, she has a shortened life. And we want to make it the best for her. Because my family, they don't give me the support I need. In one way, you know, I think, that have made me a little tough, if that's the word that I can say, because I can go anywhere by myself. My family is not with me. Nobody will stop me and forget where I want to be, even though my brain is. And thanks God, I have a lot of good friends who understand a lot more than my own family what my condition is, and who understand what I am capable to do. Maybe in Fatima's case, it was just too, too bizarre a thing to just even understand, so they just blocked it out. XP is known in most parts of the world to be 
a disease of consanguinity, where the two people who are married who have a child of this union are related. So it's an embarrassment to the family. It's, it's like a, a mark. When you have a child with this kind of disease, it's a mark that you did something bad. And maybe that's part of it, because I know Fatima's family has a cousin relationship in there. Um. He feels bad for this next statement, but it's the truth. Uh, I, I thank God every day that uh, the disease hasn't progressed to the point that uh, uh, Fatima now is uh, uh, experiencing. You mean for Katie? Well, yes. I mean, for Katie, of course. Oh. It's okay, it's okay, don't worry. It's okay. Papicalo, it's okay. It's okay, it's okay. It's okay, it's okay. It's okay, it's okay. Over the last 35 years, eight different genetic versions of XP have been identified. One of the patients we met during our filming was a young man from Pakistan who experienced great difficulty in getting a diagnosis in his homeland. His neurological disorders and developmental regression are caused by a version of XP that affects a small percentage of XP patients, but still remains largely a mystery to XP researchers. Frustrated by Karim's declining condition and the lack of a diagnosis, Karim's family moved to the UK where his condition was diagnosed and where the family received some social service benefits to assist them in coping with his condition. If, 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 if he don't want to sleep, you know, we shall sit with him all the night. If he want to sleep, we shall sleep with him. If he want to eat, we shall eat with him. If he don't want to eat, if he want to go anywhere, I am with him. His mom is with him. In this disease, you haven't any hope. And then finally, there is another entirely component to the XP story, and that's the neurodegenerative part of the story where some patients develop neurodegenerative disease, which can be quite severe. I did ask the doctor. He said, no, you can't do anything. You can't control. So, since yesterday, what I'm feeling, you know, I can't, can't communicate that from being a father. I really wanted to be able to tell those poor people that this would stop and he would do well and so forth, but it's been my experience that these patients once they start down this path, it will continue downhill. And eventually their brain simply stops functioning. They, they don't eat, and they don't, eventually don't even breathe. And it's not, a, uh, it's, not, it's not a good story. Because, you know, sorry for that. Where are we but all go this one, you know, eh? Yeah, that that him is a yeah, dirty. Yeah, he said that uh, she, 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 she shows on him, you know. No way. <laughs> <laughs> so not true. <laughs> severe neurological impairments did not manifest themselves until he was in his early 20s so he was able to experience a fairly normal childhood. 
While XP patients face serious survival issues at an early age, their childhoods are still filled with universal feelings and experiences. Um, Cody was talking to his counselor at school, and she's kind of working with Cody on, you know, uh, what he's going to do when he gets older, you know, kind of gearing him, getting him a little focused, a little sooner than most, but he needs to be thinking about that a little sooner than most, um, you know, kind of things like that. But she was talking to him, and she said, Cody, she said, I'm going to tell you a story, and she said, I want you to finish the story for me. And um, she started off with the story about a camel and a horse that belonged to the king in this kingdom. The horse was regal and beautiful and um, majestic looking, and everybody liked to pet the horse, and everybody liked to ride the horse. And um, the camel wasn't very attractive looking and just, you know, kind of lumpy. One day, the king said he was taking a long trek um, across the desert and came and asked the horse, will you go with me? And the horse said, well, I can't go through the desert. My gosh, I'll never make it through the desert. And, um, so the camel spoke up and said, you know, I'll go. I'll go with you through the desert. And um, the king said, would you do that? And he said, yeah. He said, I can make it through. Cody said, um, you know, that's kind of like me with, um, I'm the camel. He said, I'm like the camel. He said, because I, you know, I'm tough on the outside. You know, and he said, I can make it. And he said, God put me here to do things, you know, that, that other people can't do. And he said, that's, you know, that's how I am. He said, I'm like the camel. And she told me that, and it kind of tore me up a little bit. They think it's contagious. Some people say, Cody's a contagious. If you touch me, will I get the disease? And I say, no, it's it's not contagious at all. I mean, I, I, I was born with this. And they're like, oh, OK. OK, now I understand. You should probably make fun of me, but it's only the little kids. They don't know what they're saying. I know that. And they're just saying, oh, look, it's freckle face. And see, I don't, I don't really care for that because I know there's a lot of people when you go to stores or a restaurant, they just stare at me. But I don't really care because I'm used to it. But, you know, it's, it, it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard. What? If I meet someone new and I, I like them really a lot, like, uh, they, I think they're cool. And they, they, they just keep staring at me like, that, I mean, I just get annoyed. And I mean, they say they have to go home, and I'm like, okay, uh, it's, uh, it's okay. And they're like, okay, bye. And they just walk out the door, even though there's no one here. Imagine risking your life every time you went out for a walk in the sun. Now, that's what it's like for people with a rare disease called zero derma pigmentosa. 12-year-old Rafael Figueroa and his mother came to St. Louis from their native Peru last July. Rafael Sunscreen suffers from XP, an inherited disorder that leaves his skin without any defense against the sun. Rafael has had hundreds of tumors. Rafael and his mother thought they'd be in Missouri for only two months while he underwent radiation treatment. But doctors here had other treatments unavailable in Peru. What we do is remove cancers as we see them. Uh, and do a lot of preventive measures. Uh, hi, Raphael. How are you doing today? Uh, Raphael avoids sunlight. If he does go out, he always wears long sleeve clothes, a hat, and uses sunblock. I have protection uh, to the sun. That I can't be in the sun. Raphael's father and two sisters have joined the family in St. Louis. Their money has run out. His parents, a university professor and a budget planner, aren't allowed to work in this country. Here we know that without the English, um, we are just thinking and working in whatever work we, we don't mind in this. When the only thing that we know is that we need working. Raphael was born in Peru where it was very difficult for his parents to get the correct diagnosis. Even when he was diagnosed with XP, Raphael's parents chose to explore unorthodox treatments, including religious rituals and medicinal cures from the native Peruvian culture. All of these measures failed. His parents considered the XP diagnosis 
to be impossible and continued to expose him to the ultraviolet rays of the sun. It was horrible, horribly painful. If you have ever been burned by uh, boiling water, that's probably how it felt. Uh, but the pain was uh, constant. And nights were especially terrifying for me because uh, as I turned from side to side uh, on uh, my pillow, uh, the, the following morning uh, you would find me, you would find my face fused with a, with a, with a pillow cover, with a pillowcase. And my, and my mom has the horrible task of having to separate me from, from it. When I started uh, getting these uh, growths on, the, on my face, I think uh, the first one was here in my, my nose, I think. Uh, that wasn't the only one. Uh, then another one appeared on my side, the side. This other side on the cheek, then another one over time here on my forehead and uh, the tip of my ear, uh, which had to be excised or removed. Raphael, I think, is the, the classic sign of what happens to people with XP when they've spent too much time alone, where they begin to withdraw a bit, they begin to become defensive a bit. They've had too many or so many surgeries and so much scarring, they feel very self-conscious. It's later on that, that I have uh, started to, to be more open, sharing more of uh, those, those feelings, even, even if they were bad sharing my pain, expressing pain. I think he has mastered a point though now where he is, he's now working with his family's business. He's helping to teach martial arts and he will be doing a workshop for us next year on martial arts. He's doing computer web designs. He's taken another step and he's stepping into adulthood. He's looking toward life. I think he's made another step. It was neat seeing him up on the ropes. That was because I think that was a breakthrough for him. I think he had gotten a little stodgy and a little stiff because he was protecting himself from being hurt. And getting up on those ropes was, I can do this. And it gave me a little hope that he is gonna, gonna be strong into the few years ahead where he's, he's going to need to be. Once we've got the UV protection sorted, which I think we've got fairly well sorted now, it, we know it's not 100% and we're not going to go for zero tolerance. It's not practical. For us, it's not practical. But we're going to protect as best as we can. We want our children to go to mainstream school. We do not want them to be isolated. And I think in that way, we've worked very well to get that part sorted out. After that, it's how you want to lead your life. Um, even, I mean, even I'm not ready yet to let Alex just go out at any time of the day, even in all his face masks. I know some parents are at that point. I'm not yet ready at that point. And so we still, you know, the 12 to 3 period is always a funny time for us, you know, where we have to wait up about whether we let him go out and how long do we let him go out for. But, so we, you know, that's still a, that's still an issue for us. But perhaps as the years go on and our confidence increases in what we're doing, we might get to the point where we do let him go out as long as he's wearing all his gear and he's well protected. On the one hand, I recommend that uh, children with XP be allowed into sunlight early in the morning, say 6 or 7 a.m., and it, uh, just before sundown. I think that's a pretty safe time and they, they get very little sunlight. For a whole year previous to that, 
our dermatologist had suggested, or pediatrician suggested, well, we know it's related to the light. We don't know what it is or why. So keep her in from 9 to 5. So I would take Katie out 6 o'clock in the morning till 9 in the morning, figuring 9 o'clock's my cutoff point. And we'd get all the grocery shopping done. We'd get everything done before 9 o'clock. Then we're in the house till 5, and then out the door we are again. Well, this time in the summer, that's four hours of really strong light still left at 5 o'clock at night. And 6 in the morning is still awfully bright. So Katie was exposed for that year on a very limited basis compared to other children, but a lot, a lot more than she should have been. But as soon as we knew what she had, that light went out of her life forever. And she will not see that light again until she has the ability to determine what she's comfortable with. Does it, do they get sunlight that hurts them? Yes, they do. Uh, it's just a matter of tightering lifestyle and quality of life against uh, how long you're going to live. I mean, we could all we could all carry steel umbrellas around just in case we get hit by a meteor. He's a happy child. We protect him as best as we can. Um, when I say as best as we can, we know we don't give him 100% protection, but that's the balance that we give him to enable to have a, a reasonable uh, standard of living, a good quality of life. And that to us is far more important. I would much rather, I mean, it sounds horrible to say it, but I'd much rather my son had a happy life till he was 30 than live till he was 70 in the dark. We found the European parents more tolerant to the risk of UV exposure, while the American parents were more vigilant about protection. The suit you see this patient wearing does not guarantee 100% protection, so each family does make their own personal choice about the risk of exposure. November 24th, 1994, that's the day Katie was diagnosed, and um, Karen and I, our, our biggest fear was she was going to go through this world alone, so to ease that, we wanted her to meet other XP children, so she doesn't feel like she's the only one in the world. I searched the internet at work, and uh, found the... Uh, XP Society, and we read about Camp Sundown. We told Mary about that, and for the past five years, she has been telling everyone that one day she's going to camp in a big. She's going to go in a big plane across the other side of the world to camp. People can can live 51 weeks of the year waiting for this one week and knowing that these four days are going to be the highlight of their year, and and they're going to spend the rest of the year counting the days until the next one. She's having a ball, and um, it, her, to look at her face, her eyes are just wide open, and um, I find it hard to describe her. You just have to look at her to see. It's written all over her face. This year, because there were several new families that came from many different locations, to them, it was like a godsend. For them, it was finally a place where they got to meet another person for the first time who had the same disease and to learn from other families how to live their lives. detectors, and should you hear them sound, it would sound like this. Miriam came to us as a surprise. She sent an application with a picture and said she wants to be a brain surgeon and she wants to come visit camp. And we said, sure. And she came and she was just such a breath of fresh air, so full of energy, enthusiasm, intelligence. She can sit with the scientists, she can sit with the parents, she can sit with the kids. She covers all the spectrums. She's an amazing young woman. And in the younger ones, I think it's particularly sad when, sometimes when they're too young to quite understand the, how profound it is, what, what XP is, and then you see them kind of slowly coming to terms with it, um, and that's pretty sad. Each year, the nearby Campbell Hall Volunteer Fire Department sponsors a special program for the campers. Volunteers from around the Campbell Hall community come together to treat the patients to a very special evening. We are families and we live in community and we share everything in common. And um, 
we came here tonight to show our support for people who live differently and just to see how other people cope with it and to show our support. Once anyone comes here the first time, they'll always be back. It's the kids smile like two feet. Their smiles are the biggest smiles you ever seen in your life. We've had a, a local church youth group coming out to play ball with them. The firemen play as well. To me, that would not be the whole highlight of the evening. Some of the other activities would be, but they don't have a team sport. Usually, even if they can find activities, they don't have the opportunity to do it as a team. That is one of the highlights of their evening. You have people donating out of their time, their money, um, their hearts. I get <laughs> it's very emotional for me. The hard part is saying goodbye because you don't, just don't know for what circumstances they might not be coming back. That's very difficult for me. We went there, uh, Santiago, it's the second city of um, Cuba, it's quite a big place. Um, we got there um, and looked on a street map and we, f we found that the place they lived was uh, one of these massive council, uh, kind of government owned tower blocks on the main road. What's going on tonight? What's going on here in the city? Today there's carnival. What is carnival? What does it significa que carnaval? Yes. Yes. Hay mucha gente y hay muchas cosas ahí abajo y hay muchos niños en que jugar. Ya había sido diagnosticado en La Habana como un seroderma pigmentoso. En aquella ocasión tenía yo ni seis años, no había cumplido los siete años. Y en realidad yo nunca había tenido un caso de esto. Eh, busqué literatura, traté de informarme sobre el particular y sobre todo contacté inmediatamente con él, con su familia, con las dificultades que tenían y tratamos en toda la medida de las posibilidades de, de ir eh, buscándole algún tipo de solución paliativa a algunas de las problemáticas que se nos presentaron. A mí me gusta jugar, cantar, bailar, recitar. Yo prefiero este, que tenga un amiguito aquí conmigo aquí adentro para poder jugar y no aburrirme porque siempre estoy allá afuera y mi mamá me siempre me dice que entre para el cuarto y todas esas cosas. Porque yo no puedo salir del pasillo ni nada de eso, pero nada más por la noche yo, es que yo puedo salir mientras que cuando por la noche. Después nos dimos cuenta que en Cuba, por lo menos acá en las provincias nuestras, no había un caso similar. Inclusive los compañeros con los cuales nosotros conversamos, colegas nuestros, eh, no conocen la enfermedad. Y, y tratamos de argumentar todas las, las posibilidades y las opciones que pudiera tener Junior de, de detener el progreso de su enfermedad explicaba que nuestro, eh, aparte de nuestro sistema de salud, la forma que está organizada, eh, nuestra población tiene una gran aceptación a todos los servicios de salud, por la gran confianza que tiene en que siempre ha sido beneficiada por este, por este sistema de salud. It's not the knowledge that's at fault, it's the fact that there's nothing you can do once you've got a diagnosis because there's hardly any drugs available 
imaging technology is basically non-existent. Um, you know, and the health system is is kind of just got its hands tied behind its back. It knows all this stuff and it's impotent to do anything about it. Y siempre he pensado tener una computadora eh, para poderme comunicar con un niño que tiene XP de Inglaterra y Estados Unidos. Eh, y él también dice que tiene una computadora para poderme también comunicar con él y hablar con él. La fortaleza principal de nuestro sistema de salud y la fortaleza principal que ha tenido nuestro programa de genética es precisamente que como nuestro sistema de salud tiene una base comunitaria, esto permite que llegue a todas las personas, que todas las personas sean beneficiadas y que no sea nadie excluido de estos servicios, por más económico o más caro que sea, que todas las personas tienen el acceso, el acceso libre. Got his diagnosis. I think they sent skin samples to the laboratory in Washington, which was the only place at that point that actually made the diagnoses. And um, they sent this letter back to Cuba that Uni's mother showed me. They said, um, We're writing to tell you that your son Uni has been diagnosed with a disease called Xeroderma pigmentosum, which means that he, um, he can't repair any damage done by UV light and will be susceptible to thousands of skin cancers in the course of his life. The best thing to do in this situation would be to emigrate to a country with lower levels of ultraviolet light. Uh, will, he go out, will, will he go out to carnival tonight? Do you go to ir a ver los carnavales por la noche, eh? Sí. Hey, what will you do? And what Con mis amiguitos. Allá abajo se encuentra un amiguito mío. He and his family had applied to come to the camp several times, but um, because of the uh, the trade embargo that the, the US has um, imposed on Cuba, um, relations aren't uh, the best, and so um, their visas were denied for several times. Para así poder contactar con todos los niños que tienen XP y que se le alegre también un poco la vida y saber las experiencias de los demás niños, de cómo viven, cómo son, porque esto es un caso eh, que aquí en Cuba es el único niño que existe y así se podría se pudiera relacionar con las demás personas del mundo que tienen esta enfermedad. Creo que sería maravilloso. <coughs> Yeah, Count Sundown, um, what year was it? 2001. 2001 when I met Kate, which is her sister. Her little boy has XP and we went bowling one night and it just so happened me and Kate's little girl had a picture took together. And so this so happened that picture got took back here and then she seen it one day and asked who that was and Kate said, well, don't no, by the way, he's he's married, which I was at the time. And just so happened, just a few weeks later, I emailed Kate and said, um, they said I'm going through a divorce. And just so happened at the time that she just come back from Wales and she was going through a separation. So she asked if it would be all right if she emailed me. And so we started emailing and it snowballed. <laughs> it's a, a feeling you just can't describe yeah. because even though I was married for close to seven years to my wife, I never felt the way I feel towards Liz yeah. because it's just, just like Liz's mom said, that she knew when she found the right person that it will equal the love that she has for her kids. Just in a different way. Oh, yeah. Way, so it's. But our, fa our families, your mum and. I remember when I met his mum for the first time and she said to me, So you're the Leas, are you? And I was just like, Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> and, but his parents are actually real good, real, yeah. real supportive, and his whole family is. Uh, my dad is still adjusting <laughs> somewhat. We have done this fully with our eyes open at every single stage. And what annoys me is that other people haven't looked at it, but they're forming their own judgments 
without looking into what we've looked into. You know, what if Kevin gets melanoma and he's going to die? What are you going to do? And it's like, well, in 28 years, he hasn't got a melanoma, so <laughs> we're still going strong here. <laughs> so that's a, there's a lot of misconception. Um, but then all we can do is take the misconceptions and try and prove them wrong at the end of the day, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I had spoken to Alan Lehman beforehand and he'd explained to me, I said, you know, we've got this couple, she, you know, we know she's a carrier because she's a twin and he's got XP. Um, they won't be able to have children. And he said, oh, not at all. He says, if, if they've got different variants of XP, they, the one thing they can be sure of is that they won't have XP children if they've got different variants and they've got different variants so they can go ahead and have children happily. The doctor actually said we can't have an XP baby because our two XP types don't mix. So if anything, we're the one couple, and probably any, that can guarantee having a healthy baby. It's his attitude. His attitude is just amazing. And he has so much courage that I would not probably have put it in his predicament. And uh, his attitude towards things is like, oh well, you know, people stay, well who cares, I'm different, I like it, I'm just going to get on with it. And I'm just like, how can you have that attitude if it was me, I'd be this crumpled heap on the floor, like, no. <laughs> um, so it's your com it's confidence and well, that, I just have it's the attitude that gets me That's why she, she, she contributes to that, my confidence and all, by telling me, you look fine, you know, you, you're beautiful, I love you, you are, and she gives me that the confidence that I have. About an hour from London, at an old country estate, a European version of Camp Sundown, called the Owl Patrol, takes place each year in February. The windows of the estate have been specially treated to protect the patients from UV rays, and the programming at the camp is similar to that of Camp Sundown. The camaraderie in the setting feels familiar. It's just this spirit of us all being involved in it and, and bringing us together and making us realise we're not alone. Whereas any of the families will tell you that they felt isolated at some stage. And going away from camp, they feel less of that. And that's what it's all about. That's what it's, it's bringing us together. The drama group at my college, um, the Pembroke Players, as it's known, we've been raising money for XP ever since I got involved. Um, and we have a big annual pantomime at my college in Cambridge. Um, and for the last couple of years, the money's gone to XP. And I suggested that it would be nice to adopt a very kind of personal cause. Um, so adopt this little Cuban boy, see if we could raise the money. My high school, which I left about five years ago, um, randomly presented us with £800. Um, so we had enough money to bring them over at that point. I think from uni's point of view, it's to be able to play with other children, because I, I get the impression he doesn't get the chance to play with other, with other children. Um, and you can also tell he doesn't play with other children because of how he be, interacts with them. Um, and I think that's quite important to him. Well, un hecho que no ha motivado a nosotros para que el niño siga y acepte su vida, que ahora en este viaje que hizo en Inglaterra, en que vio niño con su enfermedad que nunca lo había visto, nunca había compartido con niños de su enfermedad y, y él de allá para acá ha cambiado y ha mejorado bastante, ha aceptado su enfermedad como tal. Nada de eso, el día que yo fui a Inglaterra la pasé muy bien, vi muchos amiguitos que no tenían, tenían la misma enfermedad que yo, no tenían peca y todo fue muy bueno, yo no pensé poder ir, ir allá y muy bien, todo fue un sueño y pude.
when they came to England, I thought, fabulous, they've got it. And it wasn't really that simple. Um, and to be honest, I'm not quite sure that bringing them to England was necessarily the best thing to do in the long run, because suddenly she saw these other kids who don't lead a nice life, but they have millions of things done for them that uni has absolutely no hope of. It's probably wonderful that for them to leave Cuba for a while and to be here, but I'm not really quite sure what she takes back with her, apart from the memories of having people around her and other people around her. Uh, I think it probably for Daniel, it's the fact that her, her boy is having fun which she doesn't see that much. Exposing these poor people to a week of life in England, you know, with you know, a nice place to stay, nice food, kind people, all these different um, things that we take for granted that they just don't have in Cuba. So shoving them back on the plane after a week and saying, OK, nice to have you, bye-bye. It's a question of, is it better to not know that such a life can exist, or is it better to have seen it and aspire to it but spend the rest of your life realising how rubbish your own situation is? All the doctors that know about this are trying to, they're like rushing around, like probably around a science lab, trying to find a cure and saying, this goes here, that goes there. In our laboratory tests, uh, we are able to put genes into XP cells and correct the DNA abnormality in those cells. Uh, but this effect is uh, generally uh, transient, it doesn't last. Uh, for a long time, and it's a far cry from uh, correcting a, these cells in the, the laboratory setting than putting it into a whole human body. There is nothing they can do apart from treat a tumour or a cancer or a character when, when it happens. There's nothing they can do that's going to make any difference to us at this stage. I have to keep in perspective that when we started these studies in the 70s, we had no idea even what these genes are. Now we're routinely able to put the genes into the cells. On the other hand, no human genetic disease to date has been consistently corrected. But you know, God's going to help me. He's going he's gonna to help us get a cure. And we're going to find one. And how do you think that's going to happen? I don't know. It's just gonna, God's just going to help us. He just, right, Mom? God's just going to help us. And he, he's, he's with me all the way. Research isn't really like that you can predict when things are going to be, because if I knew that, then I'd be able to do it. But I would say that um, I would be agreeably surprised if there was anything realistic happening within 10 years. Um, we have every reason to believe within the next 10 to 20 years, uh, through genetic uh, therapy and research, Katie will be the first generation to, to live to see a cure. Skin cancer is uh, the most common cancer in Caucasians in the United States. There's more than a million people a year who develop a, a new basal or squamous cell cancers. And as people get older, they have an even greater uh, risk of developing these cancers. The xeroderma patients develop these same types of cancers at about a thousand-fold increased uh, frequency. And the more we can learn about uh, why they develop the cancers, the more insights we'll have in preventing the cancers in these patients and also in people in the general population. I think the, the, the prognosis is pretty good, um, you know, for a child born in 2002 with XP, because if it's recognized early, given what we know, and we know how to protect the patient, we know how to do the surveillance, we have more medicines to treat the lesions very early, um, I think that those patients have a, a reasonable prognosis. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that I'm going to take a breath, and there's no doubt in my mind that God's not with us and that there's not going to be a cure for that little boy. It's my request if uh, to all the scientists and, you know, other people who can do research, you know, on any disease, please do for XP anything. Katie was, do my math real quick, uh, about four. I think she was four. She's going to be ten. And she doesn't have the complications that set in that Raphael and some of the other families we're loving have, you know, so for the life expectancy to jump from 17 to 32 in six or seven years, that's a good reason to give. I got a dream about that I, 
then I don't have freckles. My hair could take get in the way. And and when did you have that dream? Yeah, yesterday. Really? And so, uh, what happened in, in the dream? I was happy that the freckles came off. I was playing in the sun all day long. Really? And then how did the dream end? Happy ending. Yeah.